in. I am not moving one inch on my giving. I am being steadfast. And listen, my job, my, my income might not be uh, promised either because if, if the church isn't given, I don't get. But that's not it. I'm still going to be faithful in what God has given to our family. So, all right, I just want to pray your, over your blessing. Father, I just take your, take your, in your heart, whatever you know that God is give, telling you to give, I just want you to just... Um, just hold that number up in your in your mind. And I just want to pray over that offering. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, I want to thank you for those faithful, those who are faithful, Lord God, even in the famine. It's easy to give when the abundance is overflowing. It's easy to give when our bank accounts are full. It's easy to give after we've bought everything we wanted. But God, the test of our faith is truly giving in the famine. And so I thank you, Father, for the faithful ones who continue to sow and to give, to, that continue to give what they have, just like the little boy who gave his, his loaf and his fish. And God, you blessed it and you multiplied it. I thank you for those faithful ones. I ask your blessing upon them that it would go back to them, Father God, that you would supernaturally do what you do in our finances. And we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Wow. So can you give me my water? I'm sorry about that. <clears throat> I am already hoarse and I didn't even get started preaching. Amen. So Mara's just sharing with me. She had gotten some testimonies from people who are faithfully giving and they're already being abundantly blessed in the famine. So thank you, Jesus. Thank you. All right, well, this morning I want to speak to you about the storm. Is anybody out there in a storm? You feel like you're in a storm, that the waves are crashing, and, you know. <laughs> you know, I am going to, this is not a harsh word. This is a right word. This is a now word, okay? So if I step on your toes, sorry. Um, but let me ask you a question. Have you ever found yourself, in a dead sleep, okay? And all of a sudden, you are jolted awake by a clap of thunder so loud that you thought it hit your house. I mean, come on. You know, there are storms in life that wake us up, right? But those storms don't happen every day. They're not an everyday occurrence. But listen, when they do come, you know it. Now, there are different kinds of storms that disturb our sleep. So I'm going to be talking about sleeping, natural storms disturbing our natural sleep. And this is also paralleling to spiritual storms that are stirring our spiritual sleep or our spiritual slumber. Now, there are different kinds of storms that disturb our sleep. Now, there are the ones that slightly get you to even roll over in bed. They don't really do anything. Then there are ones that you are aware of, that you know there's a storm happening, but it doesn't affect your sleep, and you easily go right back into your slumber. Then there are the kind of storms where you just tuck your head under the pillow, and you just try to ignore it, and you just pray that it hurries up and goes away. And then there are the kind of storms, listen, I've, I've had this experience many times. There's the kind of storms that move the furniture on your deck. You can literally hear your, your chairs being moved on the deck or on your porch or in your yard. You, you know, and I remember one time my, my daughter, they, the kids, they had a, a trampoline. And there was a storm that literally picked that trampoline up and put it over on top of their shed. There are those kind of storms that move things. And it demands you to get out of bed to go and secure some things back down, right? And there, then there is the worst kind of storm that you can have, and we'll call that a tornado. And it's those kind of storms, it's, it's that kind of storm that you had better make sure you know Jesus because you don't know if you're going to live through it or not. Listen, when we think of storms, most of us think of the disturbance in the atmosphere marked by wind and usually rain or sleet or, or hail or thunder and lightning, right? 
But listen to these other definitions of a storm. A storm is defined as a disturbed or agitated state. Now, remember, everything I'm talking about today, I want you to parallel in the spiritual, right? So a storm, the definition of a storm is a disturbed or agitated state. It's a sudden or violent commotion. It's a sudden heavy influx or onset. And it's a violent assault on a defended position. I would say that we are right now in our current situation, we are in some kind of storm. We are in some kind of storm, whatever we would know or call it. Because what? Listen, it is number one, it is disturbing and agitating a lot of us, right? Come on. It is definitely causing a commotion. It came on suddenly, right? It came on like overnight. We woke up one day and like, wow, we're in this pandemic. And here's where I want to focus today. It is assaulting, or can I say, it is shaking our defended position, our faith. Come on. So here we are in a spiritual storm. We don't know what, it's physical also, but there is a spiritualness about it too. And this storm, listen church, I am talking to you. This storm is assaulting, it is shaking our defended position. We guard our Christianity so tight and we think we're so right and good. But listen, this storm is shaking As the scripture says in Hebrews, it's shaking what can be shaken. So I'm going to talk today about some reasons for this specific storm. And again, this is not a a negative, harsh word. It's going to sound harsh, but it really is to awaken us. This storm has been, been allowed. It's been given. It's been whatever. It is here for a reason. And these are three reasons I believe that this storm is is here, why we are facing this storm. The three reasons, and then we'll go into each individual one. First of all, it's a trial, it's a test. It's a trial and it's a test. We are being tested and we are being tried. Secondly, I believe these are birth pains. You know, because birth pains bring forth something. And I also believe it's, it's, uh, it's a part, it's not God's full judgment, but I believe it is a judgment from God. So again, I, I'm not saying it's every one of these specifically, but I feel like there's a little bit of every reasoning in there. And I'm going to talk about those today. So let's look at the first reason today. It's a trial or a test. Listen, in every life, there are moments that put one's faith to the test. And if your faith right now in this situation is not being tested, you probably don't have faith. (laughs) Sorry. Yeah, ouch. Somebody got stepped on. In every life, there's a moment that puts our faith to the test. Look at our father, Abraham. In Genesis, the scripture tells us that God commanded him to offer his son. Isaac, his one and only son, the son, the promised seed, the one that he waited for so long to receive. God said, I want you now to take him. Scripture in Genesis 22, verses 1 and 2, it says, Now it came to pass that after these things that God tested, underline that word, that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, take your son, your only son, Isaac, whom you love, and go to the land of Morai and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I shall tell you. See, the scripture very plainly says that God was testing Abraham. He was testing Abraham for what reason? To see who his God really was. Because church, we have to understand a God is anything that we put priority. 
A God is anything that we worship. A God is anything that we love above everything else. And so God was testing Abraham to see who was really his God. Who was first place in his life? And verse 12 tells us, now I know, well, of course, we know the whole story. Abraham takes Isaac up onto the mountain. He lays him on the wood pile. He ties him up, lays him on there, and he is ready, pulls the dagger out, and he is ready to sacrifice his son because God asked him to. And we know that God stops him, gives him a ram in the thicket of the bush to sacrifice instead. But listen, here we see in verse 12, God says to Abraham, now I know that you fear God. Now that fear, I know we're not talking about fear like, oh, I'm so afraid. Fear, it's a reverence. It's an honor. It's an awe. It's a worship. You know, so now here's the thing. When he says, now I know that you fear God because you have not withheld from me your son, your only son. See, sometimes... I believe God tests us to see what God we really serve. I believe God tests us to see what is top priority in our lives. America, I have have a question to ask you. What God are you serving? Really? Where is our allegiance? I have some facts here. Between 1700 and 1740, 80% of Americans went to church. 80%. By 1990, only half of America attended church. And here we are in 2020, only 35. Now listen, I'm not talking about the Easter and the Christmas people. I'm talking, and I'm not talking about, you know, once in a quarter. I'm talking about the faithful. 35% faithfully, faithfully attend church. Now, I know there's a lot out there that you would be here. You're saying, Pastor, I'd be there if I'm allowed. I understand that, but but get what I'm trying to say here. And I want to talk to Christians. Okay, I'm not talking to the unbelievers because I don't expect the unbelievers to uh, submit to this. But listen, I'm talking to you, Christians. The third commandment says that we are to keep the Sabbath day, what? Holy. We're to honor the Sabbath. Now, for several years now, Christians, not unbelievers, Christians, those who claim to be Christians, have taken the Sabbath as just another day to do whatever they want to do. I have literally heard people say, oh, well, this is the only day I have off. I work so much uh, and, and this is the only day I have off, so I'm not going to go to church. I want to do something for me. Let me tell you, you just put you up on the throne. You are serving you. Replacing worship. I could go on. This, this is, I don't want to go on a rabbit trail, but come on. I'm, I, I'm stepping on some toes, and you need it. Listen, again, this isn't a, this isn't a, a, a hard word. It might be hard for some people, but it's a word to wake us up. Replacing the worship of God with so many, listen, non-essential. You know, we keep hearing that word in this this storm, non-essential. You know, the non-essentials can't work. Only the essential people can work. And and the non-essential stores can't be open. And only the, listen, we are replacing the worship of our God with so many non-essential activities. And because we have done that, we have made a grave impact on our families and then thus on our nation. I see people just very apathetical, laxative for coming to church because it's not a priority in their life. I have seen people who have left the church or don't bring their children to church, but when they get older in those teen years, they they call me and say, Pastor, can you help me with my son? Can you help me with my daughter? See, when we replace the worship of God with non-essential activities, it makes an impact on our families. It makes an impact on our nation. And I believe God allows storms to reveal 
those gods in our lives. And I believe he allows these storms in our lives to help us realign our priorities. And I know if you look throughout scripture, and it's even happened with us as a nation, anytime there's a problem, the first thing we do is what? We pray. And that's great. And I want to encourage you to continue to do that. But listen, it can't, you can't only go to God in a foxhole prayer. You can't only put God on the throne only when you need him. We must repent for allowing anything to be above God in our lives. Another point to trials is to purify us. And this part of it has to do with sin. The word trial in the New Testament comes from a Greek word. And it literally means, listen to this, to pierce something to see what's inside. The original word is to pierce a vessel. If I had a cup of this, it's to pierce a vessel to see what's inside. That's what a trial does. It begins to expose what's in us. Oh, I've had people say to me, wow, this thing has really gotten me shook up. I was backsliding and, and, and I was doing things that I knew were wrong. And I'm afraid. So as soon, not as soon, but like, I'm done with this. I'm done with this sin. I'm done with this laxivity. I'm done with this apathy. I'm coming back to church. I'm coming back to God. I'm going to get my life right. Listen, bottom line, boom, that's the ultimate purpose for a trial. It begins to wake us up. Because there's a lot of Christians who are living in willful sin. Don't think anything of it. Listen, this wakes us up, right? This wakes us up. To get out of you also, the purpose of a trial is not only to pierce, to, to show you what's in you, to expose. Because at any time that we saw a situation, even in Israel, it was always for God to deal with their sin. But another thing to the purpose of a trial is to get out of you the junk that's in you. Isaiah 48, 10, excuse me. Isaiah 48, 10 tells us, See, I have refined you. Though not as silver, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. Can I read that again? See, I have refined you, though not as silver. How is silver? And I'm going to talk a little bit of how silver is refined. Silver is refined in the fire. But God says, I have tested you in the furnace of affliction. How does God test us? How does God purify us? He doesn't put us in a fire, a little fire. He puts us in the furnace of affliction. Proverbs 17, 3. The crucible for silver and the furnace for gold, but the Lord tests the heart. Listen, God is up to something and he needs a pure bride to accomplish what he has planned for us. And maybe this whole situation is to, to get the church awakened, to get her out of her apathy of her sin and start to deal with those things that we have hidden in. I want to share a little bit. I read a book years and years ago, and God brought it back to me this morning or yesterday. And it was called As Silver is Refined. And it's by Kay Arthur. Absolute great book. As Silver Refined. And I want to share with you uh, some excerpts out of this book and talking about the refinement process and how it correlates to you and I as Christians in the furnace of affliction. So I'm going to read a little bit and then I'll talk about it. So in this chapter, it says here, she begins to show about a, we call him the refiner and God is the refiner of our souls. So it begins to talk about how the refiner begins to take a piece of metal, a piece of ore out of the earth. And he begins to watch the sun play 
on the streaks and the veins of lead that are in this and other materials that are in this piece of rock that's chiseled out of the mountain. It's chiseled out of the bow of the earth. And see, you and I have been chiseled out of the earth, right? God made Adam out of the dust of the earth. So you and I are just a, a, a piece of clay, a piece of rock that God desires to take. And he looks at it. And when you take that piece of rock out of the mountain, you don't take out a pure piece of gold. You don't take out of the, out of the earth a pure piece of silver. You take the rock and you take everything with it. You take the dross, you take the other metals, you take, because what God is trying to do is take, he takes us out of the earth and he's trying to purify us. How does the refiner purify and get the pure gold or the pure silver? The first thing that they do, a refiner does, is he takes the, that piece of rock and he takes a hammer and he starts to crush it. Have you ever been in a crushing? And you're like, God, stop! And he's like, no, because the purpose of the crushing is to get you ready. Listen, church, the purpose of the crushing is to get you ready to be put into the fire. The refiner will take that and God will take us and he will begin to allow some crushing in our lives, some breaking away, preparing us for the purifying process. So he lays the ore on the work table and then he begins, listen, the, the refiner takes the ore and he puts it over here and he's crushing it, getting it ready for the fire. But while he's crushing that, he's over here making the fire ready. You remember my little video earlier this week on Wednesday, I talked to you about how God has gone ahead of us and he's prepared the way. This is the fire that God was preparing already for us. And so the refiner goes over to the fire and he begins to put full fuel on the fire, begins to, 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 you know, fan the billow to get the fire burning and to get it pretty hot. And then he goes back to the ore and the piece of the rock and he, again, crushing it and crushing it and crushing it. And then when the fire is just right, he gathers the hammered pieces of ore from the place of their crushing and he lays them in a small, sturdy container of tempered pottery, his crucible. And then he places that crucible over top of the fire. Listen, when you and I are put into the fire, it's not because God doesn't love us. It's not because God doesn't care. It is because he does love us and he does care. So he places the crucible in the fire and listen, and then he sits down and waits. He sits down and he carefully watches the fire. He carefully watches the process. Because there's an ultimate purpose in the crushing, and there's an ultimate purpose of being put in the fire, and that ultimate purpose is for you and I to come out as pure before the Lord. And this is where the refiner will set, as long as the metal is subject to the flame. Listen, God is right next to us. God is right beside us. He will never leave us. He will never forsake us. He is setting right next to us as we are in the fire. Remember the story of, of Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego? And the fourth man in the fire. He's in the fire with us, church. He carefully watches the fire because he desires for a purpose. And listen, as we are in the fire, as that, as that crucible is in the fire, as the, 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 the hammered pieces of ore is in the fire, eventually the heat begins to release things out of that piece of ore. And as we understand what a refiner does or the refinement process does is the dross, the garbage begins to rise to the top because the weight of the pure gold or silver is weighty and it stays at the bottom. So what happens is in the fire, all the garbage starts to come up. 
all the short-temperedness, all the anger, all the vulgar things that we thought we had controlled, all the sins, all the lust, all the things that we are that are un, unclean in us begin to rise to the top. And what happens then? Then the, the refiner, he'll come and then he takes his ladle and he scoops that stuff off of us. But I remember years ago, I used to preach this. I, I taught this actually years ago. And I would say, listen, God's not going to skim that crap off of us. He's not going to come over and skim that stuff off of us until we first, number one, acknowledge that it came from here. See, God, you know, we, we are not, God's not going to come and fix us up and clean us up without us knowing what's in here. Because if we don't take the, the time to acknowledge, if we, don't, if we don't own our sin, if we don't own our fault, it'll come right back the next time. So when God allows us to see the garbage that floats up, the anger, the short-temperedness, the unforgiveness, the lust, the sin, all that impurities begin to float to the top in the furnace of affliction. And when we say, God, oh, where did that come from? Oh, God, I, I, I didn't realize that was in me. Take that out. Here's the thing. You know what will we'll move the hand of God to move that, that dross out? Repentance. God, I'm, I, I repent of my sin. I repent of the garbage that's in me. God, take it out of me. God's faithful to do that. Amen? God is faithful and just to forgive us when we ask. Right? All right, let's continue. This is an amazing part, and I didn't realize this, but amid the re relentless heat surrounding the crucible, you know, as all that dross and all that dull impurities rise up to the top, I love this part. It says, and again, the refiner carefully skims away the murky, smudgy metal floating on the top of the crucible. Gazing down upon the molten surface, the refiner sees just a hint of his reflection in that gold or in that pure silver. See, the reason the purpose of trials is to get the garbage out of us so that when the refiner looks at us, he begins to see a reflection of himself in us. In the silver that he sees, and again, the process goes on and on. See, many times we want this trial, this furnace of affliction to go quickly. Oh, God, take this away from me. But sometimes we have to, you know, and in this story, we have to go through not only a crushing, but the furnace of affliction, the fire. And listen, here's what happens sometimes in the, in the refiner's process, he'll take the crucible off of the fire. Yay, God. Woohoo, I'm done. No, 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 no. He takes it off for one reason to go back here and flame the fire, get it hotter again, to put some more fuel on the fire because the process isn't done. So he comes back and he gets the crucible and he puts it back over again, the hot fern or the fire. Because he knows sometimes deep within us, deep in the crevices and the cracks, that we think that we're good. God says, okay, I just want to make sure. So he puts us back over the fire. And oh my goodness, I thought I was good. Lord, I thought I was good. Where'd this come from? And again, church, I need you to understand that when we go through the furnace of affliction, when we go through trials and testings, it's not always a judgment. It's because we have a loving father who desires to see his reflection in us. And many times when he looks at his church, he doesn't see any resemblance of his son in us. And so he allows the furnace of affliction. He allows the fires and the troubles and the trials for one purpose, to purify us. See, the refiner has taken what was impure and made it pure. 
He has taken what was dull and made it beautiful. He has taken the, the there was there was this rock, there was this sinner that has potential. See, God sees he, you and I, we might just see an ugly piece of rock, but if you take it to someone who has the eye to see the gold, the the the, the beauty in it, they'll take it through the process and get pure gold and pure silver out of it. There are some of us who, you know, we look at ourselves and we're like, we're, we're, we don't have anything to offer. We're, we're not good. We're broken. We're, we're, we're just garbage. But listen, God sees us in our form. But he also sees our potential. He sees our potential. The potential value now has become actual value. The fire the guarded, the guided, the relentless fire, the trial made the difference. And so when we look at this storm, the purpose of the trial, it's not only to test your faith, it's to purify us. And I want to speak, you know, I, I, I just, I want to want to just kind of talk to you about the goodness of our God. You know, the scripture tells us that God is not willing that any should perish. See, in this time of testing, we must yield to the refiner's fire to allow the dross, to allow our God to show us what is in us, to allow the dross to rise to the top. And here's something. Some people won't let go of the impurities in their lives. As I said, some people had said, oh man, this really wakened me up, Pastor. I'm, wow, you know, I was doing this and, and that, I was doing that and I'm, I'm, I'm on the right path now. I'm, 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 I'm good now, God. But there are other people who could care less. And I don't want to say care less. There are other people who won't let go of the draws. You know, there are some of us, as the scripture tells us, that when we come before the Lord, he's going to say, depart from me, I never knew you, you workers of iniquity. And we're going to cry out and say, God, what do you mean? I, I was in church every Sunday. God, what do you mean? I believe you, I love you. And he's going to say, depart from me. You were workers of iniquity. The fire, the storm, the trial, the test, whatever you want to call it that we are in right now is so that we deal with that stuff so that we don't ever have to hear God say, depart from me. I believe what we are experiencing is a true wake-up call. And we could go back and back. Remember when Billy Graham died, there was prophetic words that there's going to be an end time harvest. Let me ask you, church, how can, how can we, the church, gather in and be a part of the end time harvest when we have garbage in our, in our own lives? So God knows. He's ahead of us. He knows what's going to happen. And he is preparing a bride adorned with beauty. He is preparing a bride, a pure, spotless bride. He needs us. This is causing us to shake off apathy and complacency. This is causing us to look at our sin and deal with it. And some people are saying, oh, I think this is the end times and this is it. Listen, it's not the end times. I don't believe this is the end times, but I do believe what we are experiencing, other than trial and testing, is the second thing I talked about. I believe these are birth pains that we are feeling. And the scripture says that there will be birth pains. The earth will groan. Matthew 24 says, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars, but see to it. Now, let me, I'm sorry, let me, let me step back a little bit. The disciples are asking Jesus when, you know, when's the end time? When's this all coming? And here's his response. You will hear wars and rumors of wars, but see to it that you are not alarmed. Such things must happen, 
but the end is still to come. Nations will rise against nations. We're seeing that, right? Kingdoms against kingdoms. We're seeing that. There will be famines and earthquakes. We're seeing that in various places. All of these, Jesus says, are the beginning of birth pains. Then he goes on and then he says, you'll be handed over to be persecuted, to be put to death. You will be hated by all nations because of me. We're starting to see that, right? Come on. At that time, many will turn away from the faith. Are we seeing that? A little bit. And they will betray and hate each other. Many false prophets will appear and deceive many. Because of the increase of wickedness, the love of most will grow cold. But here's the word that Jesus says, but the one who stands firm till the end will be saved. Verse 14 says, and this gospel of the kingdom will be preached in the whole world as a testimony to all nations. And then the end will come. So now I want to just add to this Luke 21. When you know, if you know, understand the scriptures, Matthew, Mark, Luke, usually Matthew, Mark, and Luke are the, those, the synoptic gospels. They usually all run the same story. And in Luke's version, he added to the famine, the earthquake, he added pestilence. And you know what pestilence are? Pestilence are plagues that can end in death. So we see this, what was happening to us. We see the famine, the earthquakes. We see the crazy fires. Come on, right? Pestilence, these plagues. We see all this, but Jesus says, don't be alarmed because the end's not near. These are only the birth pains. Now, anyone who ever had a baby understands what birth pains mean. It means, listen, something's coming. Something's coming, right? And it tells us, those birth pains are telling us You better get your house in order. You better get your house in order because something is coming. So I believe that what we are experiencing, the storms that we're experiencing are testing and trials. They are birth pains. And I also believe that some of it is the judgment of God. Now, I'm not going to say it's the full extent of God's judgment because we're not there yet. We're just kind of. But listen, most people don't understand or or know what God's judgment is. They wonder, is this a natural thing? Did God allow it? Or is God doing this? The reason that judgment can come is what is called in the Old Testament and in the New Testament, judgment comes because of what's called abomination. Now, an abomination is a thing that causes disgust. And you know, just as much as I do, that there's some abominations in our nation that are causing disgust to God. Now, before I go on, let me please, 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 let me, let me um, state this. God loves you. God loves us. The scripture says that even while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. God loves us. But what's an abomination, what disgusts him is not us, the sinner, it's the sin. Okay? So we need a clarification on that. I am not speaking about any specific person. We are speaking about the sin. And so when we look at abomination that causes disgust to God, you and I know that we in America, and I can't, I'm not talking, I know this is a worldwide thing, but let's look at our home first. We've passed laws that, number one, took Bible out of schools, Supreme Court, that took prayer out of the public school, Supreme Court, that legalized abortion, Supreme Court, and that legalized gay marriage, Supreme Court. So the judges, the Supreme Court, have passed laws that if we go to the word of God, if we open, it's not my word, don't, don't, don't call me or don't, don't talk about me. I'm telling you what the word says. That if we look at the word, tells us that these Things, 
not people. These things are an abomination that curse our cities and our nation. So could it be that there's a little bit of a reckoning of God's judgment onto a nation? I mean, we talk all the time about the blood, the, the innocent blood, the millions of babies that are spilled on this land for the God of convenience. There's a reckoning. The courts of this land have passed laws to say it's okay to take a life. It's okay for, for us to, to say uh, this, is, this is okay and this is not. Listen, both of these, these things, all of these things, you know, the abortion, the gay marriage, these are laws found in Leviticus and Deuteronomy that God calls an abomination. And so although we might not truly know really what is going on, listen, could it be? I'm just putting out the question, could it be? I think it's a little bit of everything. I believe that what we're seeing in this storm is that we're being tested. The church is being tested. The church is on trial, in a sense. We are being tried and tested because God needs a beautiful, pure bride in order that we can fulfill the end time harvest. I believe that we are also seeing the birth pains, that we're in the beginning of the end. The birth pains, the earth is groaning, getting ready. And I do believe that some of what we see, we cannot continue in this bloodshed. We cannot continue in sin as a nation and think God's like okay with it. But the bottom line when I say all of this is this is not the end. God is giving us ample opportunities to turn from our sin. You know, even the scripture in 2 Chronicles 7.14, if my people who are called by my name will what? Humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Church, we can't continue to live in sin. We can't continue to condone sin and think God's going to hear our prayers. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. Then and only then. See, my God is long-suffering. He's not willing that any should perish. Can I say to you, I don't care what sin you're in. I don't care what you have done in your past. God is a good God. God is a forgiving God. He is a loving God. He is a long-suffering God. And I think he put up with a lot from us in hopes that we turn and we come back. No matter where we are, listen, we can run to the Father. We can run. We can run to the Father. We can fall into his graces. I'm going to have Marianne come up. We're going to sing a song, run to the Father. And then I'm going to lead you in a time of prayer. Can I ask you, as she sings this song, may I ask you to allow Holy Spirit, ask the Holy Spirit, Holy Spirit, what do I need to deal with? I want you to surrender. I want you to give total surrenderance to the refiner's fire. Let that dross come up. Let God begin to show you, reveal to you what's in you. Now, of course, some of you are going to say, well, I don't sin. I don't, I don't commit adultery and I don't do fornication and I'm not living with someone and I'm not in an in a alternative lifestyle. But listen, there are some of you church people. You gossip. You backbite. You have unforgiveness in your heart. Bitterness, envy. 
I could go on and on. We all need to run to the Father. We all need to fall in to his grace. While Marianne sings, please ask Holy Spirit to begin to reveal to you what you need to see. Amen. Marianne? and created to bear it alone I hear your invitation to let it all go and I see it now I'm laying it down and I know that I I run to the Father, I fall into grace. I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend. So I'll run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, oh, oh. condition had a plan from the start your son for redemption the price for my heart and I don't have a context for that I don't understand it, I can't comprehend it, all I know is I need you. I run to the Father, I fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, 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 oh again and again. Oh, in your sights long before my first breath running into your arms is running to life from death and I feel this rush deep in my chest your mercy is calling just as I am, you pull me in, and I know that I need you now. I run to the Father, I fall into grace, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart needs a surgeon, my soul needs a friend, so I run to the Father again and again. I run to the Father, I fall into the race, I'm done with the hiding, no reason to wait. My heart found a surgeon, my soul found a brain. So I run to the Father again and again and again and again. Oh, 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 again and again and again and again. Oh,
you, Jesus. We just run to you, God. We run to you, God. We bless your holiness. Father, we thank you for your goodness and your faithfulness, Lord God. We honor you in this place. We honor you in this place, God. So church, I want to I wanna lead you in a, in a prayer. I want to lead you in a, in a time of prayer because there are some of you who, some of you who are, you're in that place and, and you're being tested. Your faith is being tested and, and you are being tried in the furnace of affliction for the purpose that God wants to refine you into a pure, beautiful, spotless bride. The birth pains are coming. These are the signs to show you that there will be a time when God's full judgment, not just a little judgment, but God's full judgment will come. The question is, are you ready? We are in a time of uncertainty. We don't know what's going to happen. But listen, one thing I know for sure is God is still on the throne. He is still on the throne. And we want to we bring a, a, a place of healing to each one of us. And we want to offer the opportunity. If there are some of you right now that you are watching this, whether you're watching it right now as we're taping or you're going to watch it a little bit later, the anointing, the presence of God is so strong in this place. It is so uh, applicable to right now. We can feel the presence of God. And he is drawing you. So if there are some of you right now that you've never given your life to Christ. And this whole situation, this whole storm is just bringing pandemic of fear upon you. Listen, you need to go to the one who brings peace. You need to go to the one who the scripture says, perfect love casts out fear. You need to be, you need to come to the perfect one. And that's Jesus Christ. If you've never given your life to Christ, if you've never uh, repented of your sins, if you've never asked Jesus to come into your heart, to take your sins, to give to you in, instead of those sins, he takes your sin and he gives to you his grace, his righteousness. I want to ask you right now to pray with me. I want you to say, Father, in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, I acknowledge that I am a sinner. I have lived this life for myself. I have fed my own selfish desires, my flesh. I have shaken my fist at you at times, knowing what I was doing was wrong. But God, I've come to a place now that I understand that you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for me. God, I want you to replace the sin, take the sin, take the garbage, take the dross out of me and put upon myself the righteousness of your son, Jesus Christ, that I would know for sure, for certainty, that whatever happens and if the day that I take my last breath, I'll be in paradise with you. God, I pray that you would forgive my sins, that you would fill me with your Holy Spirit and that you would invite me, that I am now your child. And I thank you for that. Listen, if you just prayed that simple prayer, it's that simple. The church sometimes has made it too difficult. It is simply, the scripture says, if you believe in your heart and you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord, you shall be saved. The process of that then as a Christian is that we are to walk out and to make sure that we keep ourselves pure from the world, pure from sin. Now, listen, we're all going to stumble. We're all going to fall. But Je Jesus said the righteous man may stumble seven times, but he always gets up. For those of you who are Christians who have walked away from God, walked away from church, who have allowed sin in your life, and you know it's sin, because I've heard so many of you say, I know what I'm doing is wrong, but it's time that you kick that butt out and you start living for Christ. It's time that you deal with, with your sin. It's time that you repent before the Father. And then there are those of us who we just need a reassurance to know, to, to encourage our faith, to trust God in the midst of this situation, this storm, this turmoil, the tribulation, the fire of affliction. 
So I want to pray for each of you. If you've prayed that prayer with me, if you prayed to give yourself, to give your heart to Christ, if you've prayed to say, God, I, I'm, I'm repenting, I am turning away from this sin, can I ask you, you know, comment, not comment, don't comment on Facebook. Send me a private message. Send me a private email. Go on our website. You say, contact us. Uh, and you can send me, uh, I'm the one that gets that email. So you send me an email, contact me. Let me know that you responded to the word because I know there are many, many people who are listening to this who, is, who have said yes to Holy Spirit and what he wants to do. Listen, church, I, again, I don't know how long this is gonna be, how long until we all gather together, but listen, we are the body of Christ. We are the church without walls. I want to encourage you to continue to be the church. Check on your neighbors. Continue in prayer. Continue in the word. Because faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. God took away all your gods. So now you have time for him. Spend that accurately and faithfully to get to know your father. Amen. All right. I will connect up with you throughout the next week. And we will continue to love each other, be the church without walls, be the, the, the lighthouse and the powerhouse in our community. Amen? Amen? All right, God bless you and have a great, great week.